Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War Two TV in what has been quite a quiet week, but there'll be a few more shows next week. And when I get them scheduled, there's some morning ones because I'm dealing with people in Australia and New Zealand. So keep an eye on the times next week. I'm still trying to work on the shows that have had to be rescheduled. Watch this space. I'm very busy. But anyway, today's guest is Jane Gulliford Lowe's, whose first show on World War Two TV on the Halifax bomber proved to be a big hit. And she's back today to talk about her uh, work into Bomber Command's mine-laying operations. But before I bring her in, I will remind you that her book there, Above Us the Stars, is a really cracking read about a bomber cr uh, crew, and it's it's really good. And if you if she's very nice, you get signed one like I got, and um, links to Jane's website in the description below and her social media account. So without further ado, I will bring Jane in. Good evening, madame. How are you today? Good evening. I'm very well, thank you. It's lovely to be back. So... You've been up to a lot since we spoke last, you know, your, your, your education wise, writing wise. So just give a brief summary of the world, the Jane's world over the last sort of 18 months or so. Oh, gosh. Uh, where to start? Brief summary. OK, well, I've just in the last couple of weeks finished my master's degree at the University of Wolverhampton in Second World War Studies, which was absolutely fantastic. I've loved every minute of it. And I was able to study um, under the supervision of people like John Buckley, um, which was a Legend. real privilege. John's fantastic. Um, and I really, really enjoyed it. Learned vast amounts. And the reason why I decided to do that course was when I was researching Above Us the Stars, it made me realise how little about the Second World War I actually knew. And I decided it's, I really need to rectify that. But having studied it now for the last year and a half, I realised I still don't really know very much oh it's welcome so to my world you know? yeah i know yeah. as much as i learn the light at the end of the tunnel just keeps getting further and further when it was i don't know yeah. about that i don't know about that and then you find out that what you thought you did know is wrong because it's yeah. that's old historiography and that's what people thought 30 years ago but that's the the fun is uh is is the quest the fun is trying to get to the point where you understand things but again when i was look, looking for some guests we talked about a couple of ideas you've been working on this mind laying aspect um what why did it come into your consciousness to kind of have a look at it because it was sort of unknown well again it stems from from writing the book um the crew that i was writing about who we'll be talking about later on um they did quite a lot of mine laying operations i think they did six and while i was researching their story i thought right great i need to get some books on mine laying etc there aren't any there's nothing, there's nothing really being written about mine laying in any great degree. And so this sort of really intrigued me. And then when I um, started doing the MA, I thought this would be a really great subject for my dissertation because it's not one that's really been explored and it's certainly not one that's been written about to any great degree at all, really, since um, the late 1940s. So well, I decided that, that I would do the, uh, the dissertation on that. Well, brilliant. So you've come armed with a PowerPoint and we will, yes. I, you will tell me when to move on. And folks, we'll do questions as we go along. And if I mute myself, because I've got a bit of a cold and I'm having a bit of a cough. So don't worry about that. But fire away with the questions. But over to you, Jane, to take us through this this really fascinating um, um campaign. And it is it is a long campaign. I'm just going to I said I was going to hand it over to you. But I think like when we talk about the Battle Atlantic, we've talked about this before. The problem with long campaigns is they get lost against those short, swift, sharp ones everyone can talk about, like like Market Garden, a few days yeah. of, of incredible um, activity is, is easier to kind of look at than a long, lengthy operation that involves years. And that, that's what we're looking at here is a long, long-term one, isn't it? That's right. I mean, we're talking about a campaign which began in April 1940 and continued right up until the end of April 1945. And it's one which has always sort of just been there in the background. No one's really tackled it. No one's really thought if it was any of any really great importance. And I wanted to analyse the reasons. Well, why is that? Why hasn't it been talked about? What were the results of the campaign? You know, what are the social and historiographical reasons that it's been completely sidelined? Um, so that's really what I wanted to do. And but those are the issues that I explored in, in my dissertation, certainly, and the issues that I'll, I'll be touching on today. So if we can go on to the first slide, um, what I'm going to do is to shatter a few myths um, about the campaign. First one, one on the left, that's not a mine. That's not, an, that's not an aerial laid mine anyway, that's a sea mine, a naval mine. The mines that I'm going to be talking about today are the ones on the right-hand side, which are air-laid mines. 
So that's quite a big difference. The first time you ever mention to anyone about mine laying, they all say, oh, well, you know, how did they get those big round bobbly things into the aircraft? <laughs> well, they didn't. Oh. Um, so the aircrafts that we are talking, so the mines that we're talking about, the air laid mines were delivered um, by way of a parachute mechanism by aircraft uh, dropped into the sea initially from extremely low heights, just a couple of hundred feet. But then gradually as the technology changed and um, bomber technology and direction finding technology improved, the crews were able to drop them from increasingly higher heights. So right from April 1940, in the earliest stages of the war, um, Royal Air Force Bomber Command crews took part in an ever increasing number of mine laying operations to target Axis merchant vessels, Kriegsmarine ships and U-boats in the vicinity of enemy ports and harbours, and that's quite important, and in the sea lanes of the North Sea, the English Channel, the Bay of Biscay, the Baltic, and also in the Mediterranean to a degree. So the effort expended by Bomber Command was not insignificant, but yet the campaign and its achievements are a little discussed today. So what I wanted to do was to look at why the campaign has remain so invisible basically. So if we can go on to the next slide, I'll shatter another myth. Whenever you mention Bomber Command mine laying to anyone, they always say, oh yes, Arthur, Arthur Harris hated that, didn't he? Um, he thought it was a complete waste of time, complete useless sort of use of his resources. That is completely untrue. Have I got a surprise for you? Arthur Harris was the architect of the mine laying campaign and he was its biggest supporter. He implemented it enthusiastically from day one. It was Harris in the late 1930s who put out a specification for an air laid mine. And it was he who was saying both to the Admiralty and to the Air Force, this is something that we need to be looking at. We need to be getting plans underway. However, at the outbreak of war, uh, the British Standard Magnetic Mine was still in the experimental stages and it was anticipated that the weapon wouldn't be available for use until the following summer. But matters were quickly brought to a head um, in the end of November 1939, when the Luftwaffe basically beat us to it and they began laying aerial mines in the Thames, the Store and the Humber estuaries and in coastal waters at considerable cost to British shipping. So. Bomber Command and the Admiralty realised they needed to get a wriggle on and, um, you know, and start doing the same to, to enemy shipping. The problem was that Coastal Command were originally outlined to implement uh, the mining activ activities, but the sort of aircraft that they had, um, such as the Beaufort and the Botha, just weren't really suitable for carrying and laying heavy mines because these things are, are big pieces of kit they're absolutely mm. massive you know they weigh a ton the subsequent adaptations to the mines meant that they could however be dropped by the hampton bombers of harris's number five group and two bomber command hampton squadrons were drafted in uh, quite hastily to begin mine laying in april 1940. So what are the advantages of aerial mine laying? Why is it important and why is it useful? Well, firstly, it gives speed and flexibility of response. Secondly, it allows the capability of replenishing the minefield without the risk of self-inflicted damage from the field itself. So mm. whereas a ship might have to go back and lay additional mines, you know, and weave its way through the mines that it's already laid, obviously an aircraft doesn't have that problem. Aircraft also have an advantage and that they have the ability to lay mines in very shallow bodies of water, including rivers, harbours, estuaries, which obviously can't be penetrated by submarines or surface mine layers. Now, there are two types of mine laying in particular that, that we're going to be looking at. Um, the defensive type, which is laying minefields to protect your own coast and your own shipping routes from attack. And then there's the offensive kind, which is attacking the enemy and enemy shipping in its own waters. And that's what Bomber Command were planning to do here. So Harris's objectives really were twofold. When the Royal Valley was being most heavily bombed, the mining campaign made every effort to obstruct the supply of iron ore to the region, which is coming through the Baltic and from Sweden. 
and up around Biscay from Spain. And it was also intended to result in the disruption of communications in the Baltic by which supplies and reinforcements were reaching um, the German army in Russia. So it was sort of a, a multifaceted campaign, if you, if you like. Um, so what we have then is a joint effort. It's not all RAF Bomber Command doing all the work here. They are delivering the campaign, but they could not do it without the Admiralty. Well, does, this, does this tie in to the general idea of the defence of Britain? When we talk about radar in 1940 and all that, is it generally part of that? I know you said there's the offensive part as well, but is it does it come under that kind of heading of protecting Britain's shores? Not really, because it, you are looking to take the fight to your enemy in your enemy's own waters. So it, it, it's slightly different, I would, I would argue. OK. And we have a couple of questions for you before you get too carried yes, away. Certainly. So Rob Crane is saying, did they have aerial mines before the war or were they developed after the outbreak? Um, they were being developed um, before the outbreak, um, but they weren't actually available for use until the, um, the spring of 1940. OK, and Ian Carr is asking, did the British learn much technologically from the recovered German magnetic mines for the for their designs? Did, was there kind of or, or was there? Yes, shared, they did, but um, they were already doing the same sort of thing um, right. when, when they fished up the, the mines um, from the uh, German mine laying in the end of November 1939. Yes, of course, they dissected those. But I think that, you know, they were already doing very, very similar things themselves. The mines were already in a pretty advanced state of development at that point in time. OK, brilliant. That'll do for the time being. I'll let you get back to you. OK, right. Um, can we have the slide um, about the Admiralty, please? I think that's number, could be number seven. Sorry, these aren't in order. Yeah, there, there we, we go. go. I'll dot around a bit if you don't mind. That's fine. So, although Harris portrays himself as the main driving force behind the campaign, which he, he was, it was by the very nature of the work to be carried out, the Admiralty who actually controlled the operations. So Admiralty chiefs would decide where the minefields were required, would then request that Bomber Command laid mines at specific coordinates and at specific times to coordinate with um, tide times and with anticipated enemy shipping traffic. Bomber Command headquarters would have the final say on whether or not mining could take place on a specific date due to operational demands and obviously weather conditions. But mines had to be delivered to very, very specific points. It wasn't just a question of, you know, flying around a patch of ocean and just lobbing your mines out and hoping for the best. You had to drop them in very, very specific places. The reason for that is because obviously our own submarines and our own ships and our own you know, crews are, are going to be using those waters as well to some extent as well. And they need to know where those mines are being laid. So if a crew couldn't locate a particular dropping point, they would bring their mines back home with them. And that was quite a, current, a common occurrence. Mines, unlike bombs, were too expensive to be dumped in the sea. These are very advanced, very expensive technological pieces of kit. and They would be brought back home again. Unlike a bomb, they wouldn't be armed. They don't arm themselves until they're actually in the water. So that there wasn't so much danger in bringing them back home again. Perfectly safe on, on dry land. So to assist in this process of Admiralty and RAF cooperation, there were uh, four senior naval officers who were seconded to Bomber Command headquarters. And they were eventually assigned to each of the Bomber Command groups purely to assist in the coordination of the, the mining campaign, the logistics of ensuring there was a constant supply of mines from the Admiralty to the RAF. So it's the Admiralty who are developing and constructing and supplying the mines to Bomber Command, but it's Bomber Command who are actually responsible at the sharp end for their delivery. Okay. But it's a very, very closely a huge amount of cooperation that was perhaps un unprecedented at that time. Now, the Luftwaffe and the Kriegsmarine, they were both laying mines. The Luftwaffe were dropping aerial mines. But one of the reasons that their mining campaign wasn't as successful as Bomber Command's, as we will find out, was because of the, there wasn't that cooperation between the two. Typically, we see that time and time again 
between the various different branches of the the German armed forces, that lack of cooperation, mm. that sort of jealousy and pr protectiveness over a particular sphere of, of, of control and, and operations. So they weren't cooperating at all. Um, and that is one of the reasons why they didn't have the same level of success that Bomber Command eventually went on to succeed, to succeed with. So if we flip on to the, the next slide, I love this one. It's just, it couldn't be more British. So this is a picture of Admiralty staff, um, Admiralty employees making mines for Bomber Command in July 1944. And I just love the caption, which comes from the Imperial War Museum. 63-year-old Uncle John Bennett sealing off the explosive with a layer of TNT, which he pours from a jug. <laughs> that, yeah, you're right. Can that you is, imagine? That's distinctly British, isn't it? Yeah. And he's probably absolutely. got a cigarette in the corner of his mouth. Yeah, well. probably, yeah. <laughs> Health and safety, what's that? Yeah, that, that's great, isn't it? Yeah. So going back to Harris then. So Harris takes over the reins at Bomber Command um, in February 1942, and he immediately wants mine production and mine laying to be increased to a thousand a month. That's a massive jump because they're currently only doing a couple of hundred. But he hasn't got enough aircraft, enough Hamdens and Five Group to deliver that. So then the campaign is rolled out to groups one and group three, and then eventually um, to group four, and then even later on to group six. So nearly every kind of bomber utilized by Bomber Command during the war will take part in the mining at some point in time. So we've got Hamptons, we've got Stirlings, we've got Wellingtons, we've got Manchesters, and then of course the Lancasters and the Halifaxes. So Harris's plans are quite crafty. He plans the mine laying in such a way that it causes the minimum disruption to his strategic bombing campaign. So we shouldn't see it as a rival to the bombing, but we should see it instead as a complement the strategic bombing campaign because Harris plans that mining will take place on nights when bomber command can't do bombing for operational reasons or when it's bad weather or because the moon's too bright or whatever. This results in the mining crews being sent out in the most appalling conditions when it's just considered too dangerous for the, for the bomber crews to go out. So let's just take a step back and go back to basics. If we can have our, our mine uh, map up, please. Uh, our little map. Oh there we are. So here we have a map showing the main Bomber Command minefields. I'm concentrating on the Northwestern Europe minefield areas rather than the Mediterranean because only a small amount of aerial mine learning was done in the um, in the Mediterranean, and the vast majority of effort was concentrated in the area that we can see on the map here. So we've got all the way west from the Bay of Biscay, uh, right down to sort of La Rochelle and the submarine grounds around there, right up through the channel, right round um, to the Hook of Holland, um, Denmark, Frisian Islands, and then into the Baltic and Kiel Bay. So it's covering just about the whole length, if you like, of enemy occupied coastline. Listeners or watchers will know that many of the mine laying operations were, were called gardening. That was the nickname given to them. And the reason for that was because the mines themselves were called vegetables and they were to be planted or sown in the different minefields, all of which were given horticultural names. So you will see nectarines, you will see forget-me-nots, you'll see hawthorn, uh, you'll see green gauge, you'll see beach. So those are the different um, code names that that were used for all of the, of the different mine lane fields. So, as I've said, Harris takes over in Bomber Command in February 1942. And around about the same time, Joubert in Coastal Command wants his crews and his aircraft out of the mine laying operations to concentrate on different issues. You've got the Battle of the Atlantic raging, obviously. Um, huge amounts of shipping is being sunk by uh, the U-boats and Joubert wants to concentrate his resources elsewhere. Harris doesn't really have a problem with this because as far as he's been concerned, it's always been Bomber Command's baby, if you like, and he wants to maintain complete control. 
So Joubert and Coastal Command are already struggling with resources. So he and Harris agree the Bomber Command will take over just about all of the mine laying from late spring 1942. And as early as September 1942, Harris's target of a thousand mines being laid per month is being met. So if you bear in mind then that most aircraft can only carry two mines, and though later uh, the Halifaxes and Lancasters were adapted to carry four, that's an awful lot of operations being flown on mine lane. So we find that there are constant developments in the technology. There are different types of mines with ever increasingly complex time delay and trigger functions combined with better direction finding technology. And this makes things increasingly difficult for the German Navy to sweep the minefields and to clear the minefields quickly and efficiently. And the problem with mine laying is as soon as you lay the mines or your enemy realise that a minefield has been laid, he will go out and clear it or attempt to clear it. That means that you then have to go back and do it again. So it's a constant, a constant flow, a constant requirement for upkeep of these minefields all the time. And it is absolutely relentless. Now, when we get to the preparations for overload, for overload, sorry, it goes up a gear even more. In the few weeks between April and D-Day in June 44, we have Bomber Command delivering a thousand mines per week. And this is at a time when they are being called upon to do more strategic bombing. Mm -hmm. They're also required to do all the bombing in France as well, particularly targeting the transport um, hub and the railway systems, all the transport targets. So that's all going on. And he's expected to maintain his bombing of Germany as well. And he's expected to undertake this additional mine laying um, in the channel areas and around the channel ports, but also around the submarine bases um, on the Bay of Biscay, on the Atlantic side, but also on the Baltic side as well, where the submarines have their, their training grounds in, in Kiel Bay. So basically he's expected to do everything. And this is where we get the idea that Harris was opposed to mine laying because his remarks are often taken out of context completely. Yes, he's grumbling about having to do mine laying in Springer 44, but it's not the fact that he's having to do mine laying per se, it's the fact that he's having to do so much more increased mine laying as well as having to do everything else on top of that. And he's only yeah. got so many aircraft and so many crews available to him. So that's where I think the feeling or the understanding, the misconception comes from that Harris was opposed to mine laying. It absolutely was not. It was his baby. OK, so what I wanted to do when I was studying and researching this issue for my dissertation was to look at how the mine laying operations and how Harris's plan were implemented by individual squadrons. And the squadron that I chose to look at was 10 Squadron because I already knew quite a lot about their operations um, with, as a result of, of researching um, for Above Us the Stars, which focuses on, on 10 Squadron's operations. So if we have a look at that little graph thing that I've done, um, can we scroll to that one? Which one is that? That's, uh... There we go. There yeah. we go. Um, I don't know if people will be able to see that, but the green line is Bomber Command overall operations flown by 10 squadron and the blue line at the bottom um, is mine laying operations the red line is operational losses and the orange line at the bottom is mine laying losses so you can see the difference there mm. so 10 squadron were drafted into the campaign in October 1942, along with other four group squadrons, when they took delivery of their first Handley Page Halifaxes, which, as you know, and people who watch the show know me, is my favourite aircraft. I'm very, very, very passionate about, about the Handley Page Hal Halifax. The Halifax at this stage could each carry two mines, but although the later marks could carry four. So it's the Mark IIs, Mark 1s and Mark 2s that we're talking about here. 
Early mine laying operations were somewhat piecemeal and hazardous, with mines being laid from heights as low as 200 feet, frequently in appalling weather. And these early operations normally involved between one and five crews. But as the campaign progressed, and in the period leading up to the invasion, as many as 15 crews would be sent out gardening at any one time. Now, if you compare that to a typical bomber raid over Germany, you're generally looking at between 15 and 20 crews being sent out, possibly 22 on a maximum effort raid. So, but in the summer of 1943, 10 squadrons resources were concentrated on the strategic bombing offensive. You look, the Battle of the Ruhr is going on. Mm. You've got Battle of Hamburg. Then you're moving up towards eventually the Battle of Berlin later on in the year. And no mining operations took place at all for this squadron in the summer of 43. But however, with the high casualty rates um, on bombing operations in late 43 and early 44, the Mark II Halifax with which the squadron was equipped was largely withdrawn from raids over Germany, except on maximum effort raids in the beginning of 44. And instead, these aircraft were sent out to do mine laying. So they were focusing on attacking French railway targets and upon mine laying operations, particularly in the Baltic and in readiness um, for the coming invasion. So this graph shows a steady increase in their mining duties. So this is the, the blue line that we're looking at from late 43 until mid 44, with dual operations frequently being carried out in the spring and summer of 44. By dual operations, I mean that a main force of maybe 15 aircraft would bomb a ground target with another five or six crews undertaking mining operations on the same night. So there is there's a synergy there. There's a it's, it's a combined effort. So we have to get away from seeing mine laying as something sort of extra and peripheral mm. because it wasn't. It was very much part of what bomber commands were doing. And who makes the call about the you know you said about depending on the conditions. So if they can't go the, the, the strategic bombing, they they do mine uh, laying. But who who makes the call? Is it done for the kind of each group have its own officer or is it no that will, that will come from hq that will come right. from hq okay yeah and then be communicated to the groups um yeah. if you won't mind doing another couple of questions now because people are firing away with some great questions so ian carr is saying let's go back to the map there some of the mine laying shown in the baltic baltic is extremely close to neutral sweden was there liaison about this with the swedes there wasn't liaison no and lots of um swedish shipping was lost um, that's something which I, I will come on to later on. Cool. Um, Sweden also supplied lots of so-called neutral neutral crews who sailed on German ships. And that was obviously a massive bugbear as far as the Allies were concerned. And that is something which I, I will touch on um, later on when I look at the results and the impact okay. um, of, of the campaign. So and Paul we, Forrest, yeah. thank you, is saying, was the priority target merchant shipping or operational or didn't it matter as long as they're getting ships? Both. Yeah, both. both. Yeah. Okay. Um, Thank you. In, in equal measure, whatever was there. Okay. And Kevin was Jones, around. about where was the main manufacturer of the mines? Was it spread around the UK? I mean, and, and again, to add to that question, were they kind of, is it like some of the other stuff the British are making that a little bit is made in one factory and, and some somewhere else, or, or an assembly is done in other places, or are they all made completely in no, one factory? No, these are all made more or less, I think, in, in just a couple of sites by the right. Admiralty. Um, so very, very closely controlled operations. No, they weren't sort of spread out different components here, there and everywhere. And they were made sort of more or less on a production line, but in specified areas. Yeah. Okay. Then we'll do, it's one more, then I'll let you go back to you. So Bruce yep. Day is asking, did the mines fit in standard bomb racks or was something special required? No, they didn't. Uh, the Most of the aircraft bomb base had to be adapted so they could carry both. Right. Brilliant. And that's one of the reasons why it took so long, um, why from sort of December, November, December 39, until April 40, when the first mines started being delivered because adaptations had to be made um, okay. to the Hamdens to allow them to, to carry the mines. But then as the campaign progressed, the aircraft were all fitted with the capability to carry mines or bombs. Brilliant, okay, back to you. Okay, right, where was I? Yeah. Um, yeah, so with regard to, to 10 Squadron, we, we had these sort of dual operations uh, being carried out. 
10 Squadron were still carrying out mine laying in April 1945. So right up to the last minute, this was still being carried out. The squadron carried out a total of 65 gardening operations um, during the course of the war with the loss of only four aircraft. They were extremely lucky. That was a very, very low rate of loss. I'll come on to talk about um, losses generally um, when I talk about the results later on. But that was very, very low, even by mine laying standards. They were extremely lucky. Compare that with the same period. So October 42 to April 45. They undertook 278 bombing raids with the loss of 104 aircraft in their seven man crews. So the difference is massive. Mm. So even though they are undertaking quite a bit of mine laying, this particular squadron were very, very lucky. Other squadrons weren't so lucky. So can we shatter another myth while we're on? Can we have a look at the slide which says um, the milk run, please? That is That's the, the crew in the briefing. 10. Hall, there we go. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Crews of 99 Squadron at RAF Lake in Heath at a briefing for mine laying off the Dutch coast. One of the things I often hear is that, well, oh, yes, it was only rookie crews that ever did um, mine laying. Again, that's another myth. That's completely untrue. The RAF did have a policy at the outset of using freshman crews for mine laying operations. There was a Bomber Command Directive on the 13th of December 1940 confirmed that until further notice, only learner crews are to be employed on gardening operations. So this is when the policy was very, very first being implemented. But the policy of using new crews for mine laying operations waxed and waned over the entire course of the campaign, always fluctuating with the needs of the strategic bombing campaign. By mid-42, it had become evident that the use of inexperienced crews for mining was contributing to a, a very steep increase in aircraft losses. So sending these kids out on their first run over to the Baltic, over to Kiel Bay, whatever, where you've got extremely heavy anti-aircraft defences, it was absolutely suicidal. So that really needed a rethink. And by mid-43, the policy had changed again. And this was evidenced in orders um, issued to number five group on the 15th of September 1943, which stated that newly joined crews should be detailed wherever possible for one mine laying mission before carrying out their first bombing operation. This is not to be taken as implying that it is an absolute necessity for every newly joined crew to carry out one mine laying mission before becoming eligible for bombing. This proviso meant that implementation of this policy differed hugely from squadron to squadron and from week to week, depending on the operational needs at any given time. Now, if we go back again to, to 10 squadron, in practice, many of the new 10 squadron crews were never afforded the opportunity of going on the milk run or having that one mine laying operation under their belt. Um, as previously discussed, gardening operations were pretty much suspended um, at the height of the strategic bombing campaign in mid-43. With attacks on the Ruhr Valley, Hamburg, Nuremberg, Berlin being the focus of attention. So in reality, and despite the official policy that crews were to be given one initial mine laying raid, there just weren't enough gardening operations taking place to make the blooding of new crews a practical possibility. So of the 104 new crews who joined 10 Squadron in 1943, only one was afforded the luxury, if you can call it that, of a first mining trip, that of Sergeant Hewlett on 7th of March 1943. And 39 of those crews who were lost that, were actually lost that year, many on their first operation. So it's quite, quite sobering. So as mining operations began to increase again in late 43 and into 1944, given the heavy losses of inexperienced crews over the heavily defended Baltic in particular, different gardening areas were allotted as between experienced and inexperienced crews. So freshman crews were sent to the French, the Atlantic coast, the West Coast Gardens, south of St. Nazaire. And in the North Sea, they were sent to the Nectarines and Hawthorns, which was um, the sort of Frisian islands and up the West Danish coast. But experienced crews 
were given the job of flying over Germany, over Denmark and into the Baltic areas and into Kiel Bay, which was extremely heavily defended. But curiously, at this time, neither training at the operational training units for bomber crews nor at the heavy conversion units included any practical training other than the classroom or flying time devoted to practicing mine laying operations. So if you're sending a rookie crew out on their first operation to do a mine laying thing, it's not something that they've practiced before. They haven't got a clue. Wow. So in my mind, that's asking for trouble. Mm. If we have a look at the colour photograph of the crew, which is the Pennycock crew. Uh, yep, yeah, there we go. And that's them on the 8th of March, 1944. So this again is a 10, 10 squadron uh, crew. They completed their tour on that date, but their log books, and there's an extract there um, from their wireless operator, um, Jack Clyde's log book, shows the amount of mining that they were doing at the end, towards the end of their tour. So this is sort of January, February, March of, of 44. They didn't get to do their first mine laying up until the 7th of October 1943, but they joined 10 Squadron back in May. So it was just a question of what was going on in the wider sort of logistical and, and mine laying campaign as to when and if you ever got the chance to go. They did six mine laying trips out of their, out of their total tour, which is quite a lot. But again, that was because what was happening with the Halifaxes and the Halifaxes being taken away from bombing raids over Germany and yep. given given other tasks. So that's a perfect example of that in operation. So what I want to do next then is to have a look at what the results of all this mine laying actually was. So if we can look at the results slide, yeah. How do we actually measure success how can you tell whether a ship's been sunk by a mine laid by bomber command six months ago or by some other means mm. the admiralty and bomber command developed a procedure whereby a enemy vessel will be considered to have been sunk by an air laid mine if it was went down in a known air laid minefield and if there was no other reason given for its sinking right. so if it hadn't been torpedoed by a sub or by a ship or, or whatever um or attacked by um by coastal command in a direct attack it would be assumed that it had been sunk by an air laid mine but it's very very difficult at the time gathering information so Bomber Command and the Admiralty are dependent on information coming from all sorts and intelligence from all sorts of different areas. So ships that are in the particular area might spot a ship going down and report right. it. Um, submarines in the area might see something going on. They might report it. Um, air reconnaissance, reconnaissance, but they're also dependent on intelligence networks as well. Um, and also information coming from neutral countries. So we mentioned Sweden earlier. A lot of information was coming out of Sweden as to what was going on with, with shipping, particularly in that in that Baltic area through the Kattegat and up to and up to Norway. So there's a lot of information coming coming in from there. So the statistics are inconsistent. Right. I sort of went on a, a deep dive, a deep trawl through all of the records in the National Archives, and I come up with various different records of what the final totals were. The lowest I can find is in a report, or rather uh, an essay by Christina Goulter, Professor Christina Goulter, who's written extensively about um, Coastal Command's work. And through her calculations, she came up with a figure of 638 ships sunk by Bomber Command's air laid mines, which is quite a lot. Other figures, including those um, from Bomber Command and the Admiralty, put the figure around about 750. Some estimates put it as high as 846. So I think we can probably say, as an average, something round about 700 will, will be a good figure to, to work from, which is a lot of ships, yeah. a huge amount. When I began this exercise, I thought, oh, maybe what, 30, 40, 50 would be a good result. 
but no, it's a massive amount of enemy vessels, both um, naval and merchant. So, yeah, huge effort. But we can't only look at the mine lane campaign in terms of shipping and tonnage sunk. There was also a much wider effect, a much wider impact that is a very, very important part of how we view the campaign as a whole. Firstly, there was massive disruption to U-boats. Not many U-boats were sunk by air laid mines. I think there was only possibly four. But the disruption that it caused to their operations was massive, particularly in the training grounds in Keel Bay that we've mentioned. We've mentioned Keel Bay a lot, but it's really, really important. And because you've got all the submarines being launched from that particular area, they then go off to do their sea trials um, in the Baltic and, and around the Keel Bay area. And that area is just absolutely littered with Bomber Command air laid mines. So it causes them to keep pushing their training grounds further and further mm. east. But the problem with that is you are pushing them further and further towards Russian influenced and Russian controlled areas eventually. OK, so it causes massive disruption to the U-boat training program. The next knock on effect, if you like, is the diversion of resources. Yeah. Massive, massive diversion of resources to mine sweeping and to anti anti aircraft defences. So you find coastal areas, ports, harbours being massively um, reinforced with anti aircraft guns, which are being taken up, taken away from duties elsewhere um, to try and protect the harbours and ports, estuaries, rivers, canals, of course, as well um, from mine laying activities. And you've got a huge diversion of resources in the German Navy to mine sweeping. So mm. something like 40% of the Kriegsmarine activity is actually being directed towards mine sweeping in 1944, which is an absolutely massive amount. So all that men, ships, resources in terms of building these ships, building these mine layers, because of course the rate of destruction of these was, was enormous. They used to get blown up all the time. So that's a really, really important factor that, that doesn't get considered at all. And then well, we also just, just to jump in with the point is that yeah, because they were in a sense fitting in the mine laying around everything else, the strategic bombing and the transportation plan in Normandy, it's kind of a you could see it as a bonus in a sense. In, a, in yes. a, the, the, the air crews couldn't be doing something else. Okay, they're doing more sorties. There, it's putting pressure on them mentally. It's putting pressure on the airframe, but. All of that, though, it's keeping the pressure on the Germans too. If we're exactly. only the Allies are only attacking the Germans with strategic bombing, the Germans have got, in a sense, days off when they can get ready for the next time, or they can repair the damage the previous, or they can move move their their Luftwaffe squadrons around, whatever. If they if the Allies are keeping the pressure on in between the strategic bombing with the sea the, the mine laying, it's just keeping that pressure cranked up on the Third Reich constantly. Absolutely. And I think so. Even if they've got no ships at all. The pressure alone is part of part of the uh, the, the weakening of the, the the Third Reich, I think. That's right. Yes, and there's also the disruption to trade because you've got all yeah. your iron ore, which Harris was talking about at the beginning, um, and all your minerals coming in from Norway and coming from Sweden, um, coming into Germany via via the Baltic, via sort of Kiel that, that way on. Those ships are being sunk, and you are seeing um, a downturn, and actually amount of imports coming into Germany, the actual raw materials for them to keep their war effort going, they are being diminished. And it's just causing huge disruption in their transport networks generally, because the point comes where they are loath to transport their goods, their men and their materiel by water because it's becoming such a problem. So that mm. they are then forcing them onto the roads, onto the railways, which of course are being attacked by Bomber command. So it all sticks together as far as I can see. Yeah. It's all part and parcel of, of the same thing. We shouldn't see mine laying as just as a simple sort of peripheral task that they did for the Navy because it's not. It's very much part of the overall thing. You've got you've got to see the bigger picture. With it, it's it's like that idea we talk about the combined bomber offensive. And this is it, it's not just the the, the 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 aspects we think of because of movie. It's this whole 
they say pressure that the, the, the bomber command in conjunction with coastal command in conjunction with everything else that the, the Admiralty is just keeping that pressure on from on a kind of a, on, on an aerial equivalent of a broad front, I suppose, is the way to look yes, at it. Yes, that's right. And it, it's all those things that, that you don't think about as well. It's the clogging up of the repair yards. Yeah. Not every vessel will be sunk, but a lot will be damaged. So you're clogging up the repair yards. Your insurance rates for merchant shipping are going through the roof. Mm. You've got neutral crews from uh, Sweden refusing to sail. And you're, as I've said, you're forcing your seaborne freight onto land, which is already very heavily co congested and, and disrupted. And you're also restricting and disrupting troop movements to and from the Eastern, Eastern Front and Norway Remember, you've got around about 400,000 troops in Norway who all need to be supplied regularly. There's a constant flow of naval traffic and merchant traffic up and down and the Norwegian coast to keep all these troops supplied. And that's heavily disrupted as well. Okay. So the overall effect is quite substantial, but it's one which just hasn't been talked about. It's just been completely ignored or sidelined. And I'll come on to the reasons for that um, shortly. I just want to slip on to the next slide, um, which is our statistics. Every talk needs some statistics, doesn't it? Right, yeah. so we've got mining sorties flown by Bomber Command, 119,917 sorties. It's a massive amount. That's huge. Vessels sunk. I've chosen the lower figure just for the yep. point of comparison. So 638 plus. What was the cost? 450 bomber crews and their aircraft were lost, the vast majority of whom were killed. Because if you get shot down over the North Sea, over the Baltic, whatever, the chances of you being picked up are zero. Yeah. So the success rate then is one vessel sunk costs around 0.55 aircraft or 31 sorties. If we then compare that with direct attacks by coastal command, so strike wing attacks, etc., and also bombing operations against shipping by bomber command, you've got 37,837 sorties flown, vessels sunk 366, but your expense rate is massive. Mm. You've lost 857 aircraft doing that. So your success rate for direct attacks is so much lower. You've got one vessel sunk costs 5.28 aircraft for direct attacks and only one vessel sunk per 104 sorties. So the difference is huge. So that makes air laid mining a much more economical way of attacking your enemy's shipping than direct attacks. So much more economical. This was realised at the time. But afterwards, and after the war, it got completely forgotten about. It got completely sidelined. Wow. So, yeah, so that, that that's, that's quite something, isn't it? So in the last sort of part of the session, I want to have a look at what the aircrew experience was and the, the comparison um, with sort of strategic bombing, if you like. So how did the crews who were required to undertake mining operations actually view them? So how did their experiences and the subsequent handling of their testimonies contribute to the erasing of this campaign from academic and popular history? So an anal analysis of the language used in the official contemporaneous literature to describe my lane is really revealing. So, for example, we have the crew do not have the satisfaction of seeing even the partial results of their work. There is no mm. cloud explosion, no burgeoning of fire to report on their return home. At best, all they see is a splash on the surface of a darkened and inhospitable sea. A mine laid in April may not claim a victim until June, July or later. It is a matter largely of luck and the volume of sea traffic passing through the area mined. Many results will not be known until after the war is over. Perhaps never. And that comes from this booklet which was published in 1940. Oh, I've got a copy of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Bomber Command. We see in these um, HMSO publications regular reference to mine laying. So 
Bomber commands are making an effort to try to explain to the, the, the general public, if you like, what's going on and why it's important. Likewise, in these um, broadcasts, which were um, sent over the BBC, we speak from the air, and over to you, broadcasts um, by the RAF. Experiences from crews who are doing mine laying are included in all of these. But in terms of the veterans themselves, it's an unsatisfying activity for the reasons which we've just mm. described. They can't see anything, they're flying around in the dark, splash, that's it, they go home again. It's an unsatisfying activity. But it's also a dangerous activity. There's an account by Flight Sergeant Fish from 153 Squadron who describes the um, hazards encountered by his crew. We carried six parachute mines, and as soon as these had been dropped, a German fighter appeared, obviously vectored onto us by ground control. We fired and corkscrewed and vanished into the cloud, but in the next th 30 minutes, we saw three of our aircraft shot down. Our squadron was lost one aircraft that night and had another badly damaged. Owing to heavy losses on gardening ops, the wing commander sensed the drop in morale and offered to go on the next op. His aircraft, plus another from 153 Squadron, was shot down that night and all the crews were lost. If you went down in the sea at night, you didn't have much of a chance. So it's not the simple, boring, straightforward operation that it's often portrayed. First of all, you had made well. You you had many enemies, and not just the Germans. You, the, your main enemy was the weather, because remember, you are being sent out when it's considered too bad, too dangerous weather conditions for strategic bombing to take place. So you're being sent out in freezing weather, particularly. In, mine laying takes place a lot in winter conditions, so you've always got the risk of freezing. Um, you've got the problem of disorientation if you're functions, sorry, if your um, instruments malfunction on your aircraft, you are flying very, very low over the sea in darkness, in bad weather. It's very, very easy to become disorientated and not realise where you are, get lost, etc. If your compass fails or something like that, you've had it. You've got coastal defences. The vast majority of mining is taking place very, very close to enemy coasts. That's the whole point. So you have got anti-aircraft fire. You've got um, these the terrible flak barges which kept popping up from time to time. Um, the crew that we saw earlier, the, the Pennycock crew, they were fired on uh, by a flak barge and they were actually hit, um, fortunately not seriously. Um, you have in your coastal areas in particular, you've got lots of searchlights. This particular crew were coned on their second last um, operation and they were coned for five minutes while mine laying from 500 feet over La Palice and La Rochelle. And this is in March 44. So the dangers are huge, hmm. but nobody ever really talks about that. It's dismissed as a, you know, sort of a, an easy, um, a, a, an easy task, if you like, um, a, a bit of a let off, a, you know, yeah, I'd rather do mine laying than flying over the rule. Well, yeah, you might well say that and with good reason. It's like being savaged by a tiger rather than a lion, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's, it is, it's a different kind of danger, still, but yeah. It's, it's still, you know, it's it's still an inherently dangerous activity as those those um, figures of 450 uh, bombers lost um, shows. Hmm. So I also wanted to look at the reasons as to why it's being do you mind if we do a few questions yeah, first? Sure, sure. Get yeah, sure, sure. They're flying. We won't better get to all of them, folks. But oh, um, right. okay. uh, yeah. quick one from Rob Crane. What happened to the parachute when they were dropped by a parachute? Were they, did they... It just went underwater and took it with it, and it gradually just came off and, and floated away. Okay. Another one yeah. from Trent Talenko. Do you know anything, any particulars about the RAF mining of the Danube River to cut Romanian oil bars traffic in 1944? Yes, I do. Yeah, um, that's a whole nother, that's a massive topic in itself, though. Yeah, you've got lots of um, mining of the Danube and also of the, um, the canals in mid to late 44. Okay, cool. We can but, do a separate yeah, show. Yeah, on American that crews were involved in a lot of that as well. Right. Um, it wasn't just wasn't just the RAF doing this. I need to point that out. Particularly later on in the war, um, our, uh, U.S. crews were, were undertaking mining as well. 
Okay, thank you. We're getting questions about did the mind have a built-in lifetime and questions about the clear up after what I think I'm guessing that's going to come up in your summing up as to why it doesn't get talked about. But anything you want to say about about any tech to make these things? Did they have a life expectancy? Yes, they did. The later ones certainly did. Initially, they didn't. Um, but as techno technology advanced, that they did. They had um, a mechanism whereby they would just go dead after a period of what four months, six months or whatever. Um, but they were really, really crafty. You could lay a mine with a particular mechanism, which was set so that a minesweeper could pass over it four, five, six times and it wouldn't go off. But on the seventh time, it was primed to go off. So they think they've cleared that area. Shipping comes through. Bang. Yeah, the technology is just amazing. And it just continually develops throughout the course of the war. And the way that Bomber Command did it was that they would mix and match different types of mines. So you would have acoustic mines triggered by sound of a ship's engines um, mixed in with magnetic mines just triggered by a large metal object passing overhead. Okay. So they were very, very crafty. So the Germans really just couldn't keep on top of, of what was happening. Um, and they're constantly, constantly having to go out and clear mines all the time and just expended Brilliant. a huge amount of resources, as we've seen. So, yeah, I just want to finish off by touching on the, the reasons for the absence um, for the campaign from the historiography. If you can go on to the final slide, Paul, which is the, the one with the yellow box on. Yeah. So why is the campaign so invisible? <clears throat> a lot of this relates to post-war criticism of Bomber Command. By sort of late 1940s, everyone's, well, even immediately after the war, after hostility ceased, everyone's stepping back. Distancing themselves, distancing themselves from the strategic bombing campaign from Harris. Nobody wants to know him. He's persona non grata. Harris was the mining campaign's biggest fan. He mentions it in his, um, his autobiography, how successful it actually was. But of course, by this time, nobody wants to know about Bomber Command and nobody wants to know Harris. Secondly, there was the refusal to publish Harris's dispatches in the London Gazette. Um, in his dispatches, which is basically his summary of Bomber Command's campaign, he includes a detailed section on the mine laying campaign. The results, um, the work that was done, doesn't get published. So as far as the general public is concerned, nobody knows about it. But more interestingly, the mine laying campaign was completely ignored by the British Bombing Survey Unit when they come to do their work um, in, in the late 19, 1940s. There's like a few lines on it here and there, but by and large, it's just not considered part of what Bomber Command were there for. Again, it's that thing of, oh, mine laying was just a, a, jo a job that we did for the Navy. It wasn't important, you know, um, and it just gets completely bypassed. The detailed accounts of Bomber Command's mine laying operations are contained within the Air Historical Branch documents. Now, they were written from sort of early 1960s, I guess, well, from sort of late 1940s right up to, to the early 1960s in a, in a rel relatively piecemeal fashion. But these were internal documents for the RAF and they weren't actually made publicly available until 1976. And they've only recently been put online for general access for, for everybody to, to have a look at. So the most detailed assessment of the campaign wasn't available to all of those historians who were writing about strategic bombing um, in the 60s and in the 70s. So again, it gets completely sidelined. And again, we have a look at what historians are talking about and what questions they are asking Bomber Command veterans. No one is asking about mine laying because of that sidelining of the campaign. So it almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, if you like. Veterans aren't asked questions about mine laying to any great degree. So their accounts aren't included in the history books, either the academic history books or in the popular histories. So if you look at something like Max Hastings book on Bomber Command, which everybody you know referred to as like you know the be all and end all at the time when it was published. He barely mentions mining operations. I think he devotes just a couple of lines to it. But even sort of academic writers, such as Richard Overy, for example, in his books um, on Bomber Command and the Bombing War, he doesn't mention it. 
and again, and that sort of is then translated to naval historians as well. They're not really talking about it. The only one who really does is Roskill in his um, official history. Um, he talks about Myling a lot, but again, air power historians, they, they, they're, not, they're not reading Roskill. They're looking elsewhere. So it just gets completely forget forgotten about and completely sidelined. And those veterans who took part in the mine lane campaign aren't being asked to share their experiences because no, no one's interested in it. Historians aren't asking the right questions because the, you know, it, as far as they're concerned, it was just, you know, a sideline. And that's been the, the, the crux of the problem, if you like. So to sort of conclude, we need to stop viewing mine laying as a peripheral task the Bomber Command carried out for the Navy. It was an important and significant part of what Bomber Command did. I've argued that it should be viewed as a significant and highly successful part of Bomber Command's anti-transport campaign, because that's ultimately what it was. Mm. And we need to see the bigger picture and we need to see where Bomber Command's operations are fitting in to a much sort of wider, I don't know, a, a, a wider historiography of the, mm. of, of the Bomber Command campaign. You can't examine Bomber Command and not look at mine laying operations as far as I'm concerned. No, I think I agree. And we'll, we'll do some questions in a minute, but I think... Rob Crane maybe is summing it up by saying maybe there's a sense that it wasn't proper warfare, too sneaky and un-British. You know, we we could go down the rabbit hole of talking about how venerated Guy Gibson is and dam busters and chastise and that kind of plucky flying at low level through flak to drop a bomb on a target. Somehow that appeals yes, to the imagination more than this. Yes. Which it's is just a not delayed... seen as glamorous. And it wasn't glamorous. It was no. tedious. It was difficult. And it was dangerous but not in the same sort of spectacular way that, you know, the strategic bombing is on over land, certainly. Mm. Jeff White is asking, you know, I know you've kind of summed this up, but um, uh, where is it now? He's asking about how, yeah, in uh, what acknowledgement did the Royal Navy give to the, com the campaign? <laughs> this was a big bugbear of Harris's. You constantly complained throughout the war yeah. that the bomber crews weren't getting sufficient recognition for the work that they were doing, and he heaped this at the Admiralty's door. Now, there are um, letters passing backwards and forwards between Harris and the Admiralty, where after Harris's complaints, the Admiralty send you know, letters saying, oh, just say, you know, jolly well done to your chaps kind of thing. They're doing very, very well with this, with all of this mine laying. It, you know, we, we know that they're getting results, etc. But that's not being sort of transmitted elsewhere. The rest of the population, uh, you know, the, the government or whoever, everybody else is not picking up on that success. And towards the end of, of the war and after VE Day, when, you know, all the, the different branches of the forces are publicising what, what, what they did and what, the, the, bit, the bit they played. Yes, the Admiralty do mention Bomber Command's mine laying, but it's only sort of in passing um, as compared to, to their, their own mine laying that they were doing, you know, shipborne mine laying. So, yeah, it just doesn't get the, the recognition by anybody, really, that, that it deserves, except from a very sort of small, hardcore number of supporters within the Admiralty and within Bomber Command who've been there from the outset, the implementation of the campaign, um, supporting it and you know, and delivering it, really. OK, thank you. Well, we'll do a few more questions now, if you don't mind. And That's folks, cool. we will be able to get them all, though, as we'll be here to <coughs> or something. But Kelly's History is asking, did you find any info, info about what aircraft were preferred for mine laying? I've noticed during the Ruhr battles, the Sterling and Wellington did most mine laying, Lancaster did very little. Yeah, the Lancasters were obviously being kept for the um, for the strategic bombing campaign. Although they did they did do a bit certainly, um, but the reason for that was that because they had such a big bomb load, they're dropping cookies and blood butters and God knows what else um, on Germany. Whereas your um, your other aircraft, your Halifaxes, your Wellingtons, or whatever else, can basically do the same job as far as mining is concerned, um, and they can just you know deliver the mines. Although the they had smaller bomb loads, sorry, smaller mine loads carrying capacity um, than the Lancasters did. But the Lancasters, 
they're the darlings, aren't they? Yeah, <laughs> this is one yeah, of my yeah. other book bears. Yeah, they're yeah. the darlings, and they are um, saved for the strategic bombing campaign by and large. But they, they do do some mine lane quite quite a bit actually, but not okay. nowhere near as much as the Halifaxes and the other aircraft did. Now you kind of covered this up. We're talking about which groups are involved, but to kind of put it into a kind of easier to understand formula, Alan is asking: Do we know how many crews out of area command bomber command were involved in these operations? I don't know. That would take absolutely months to work that one out. You'd need to go into each squadron's records and look at their operational record books and see how many crews were sent out on mining operations on a particular night. And I don't have that much time. Okay. <laughs> I would love to, but no. So people are just think, I'm just kind of taking a, an idea of what the, the general opinions are in the uh, in the comments and you know the, the fact that it, there's a long lasting this you know when the clear up operation I mean I'll ask you about yeah. that now the clear up was going on for for, for decades to a, to a certain it's still going it's still on still going on yeah still um, going on. Yeah. So that, that, that's something that was it. The other thing, I can't scroll back and find it, but Ian Carr was asking, because you talk about the German difficulty in, in sweeping for these mines, did the Royal Navy, who would might be going through some of the areas that had already been uh, air mined, were they given special information about how best to sweep their way through it when we're going on the offensive? They would be avoiding those areas completely by completely. and large. Okay. Um, this is why there was so much close cooperation between the Admiralty and the and the RAF, because the Admiralty would tell the RAF where to lay the mines so that the Navy didn't have to sail through those particular areas. So it was all about being, you know, laying your mines in a particular place, which is a danger to your enemy, but which does not cause danger to your own shipping. Right. OK. Um, and I feel we've got that more... poster. Um, I forgot to mention as well the, the German poster warning about the, the presence of mines. Yeah, we'll, we'll put that up. Um, Hang on, that's. Uh, that uh, 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 yeah. So these posters um, started to appear um, all over in, in sort of coastal towns and, and harbours, warning people to look out for these mines um, in rivers and canals as well as the sea, and warning them how dangerous they were and not, not, not to touch them, basically. So, yeah, mining was a massive problem. That just reminds me that a German parachute mine, just like that, landed um, at the end of my grandmother's street in May 1944. And the size of these things were absolutely enormous. It was aiming for the docks, which were about half a mile away, missed the docks, hit um, two streets in her town and virtually demolished an entire block. Because these things are absolutely massive. That they're, well, they're designed to blow up ships, so you can imagine yeah. that the, yeah, the yeah. impact that they're going to have on um, on a row of houses. Yeah, so go back to the questions, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, so Jack Hunter, is uh, he's a bit of a mine expert. Did the Hi, aftermath yeah. of the Texel disaster in mid-1940 bring an uptick in gardening ops to pick up the slack left by the reduction in destroyer mine lane? Um, possibly, because this is at the time when mine laying is really, really getting underway. So we're talking from April 1940. So, yeah, probably there is some knock-on factor, definitely. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah, people, some people ask about were they stationary, were they floating, were they anchored? Uh, no, it's uh, not a silly question. I should have explained this from the outset. So the floating mines, remember the pictures of the two yeah. mines that we saw at the beginning? So the floating mines were, were, were naval mines. The air laid mines were heavier. They were intended to lie on the bottom of the canal or the floor of the harbour or the floor of the sea um, in in relatively shallow waters generally. But no, they, they were not they were not floating they, so, okay. so that they couldn't be seen. That was the whole point. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to go back if there's anything really cool questions to ask. There's, there's just lots of oh, oboe came up in the conversations about whether that that was used with this. Is, is that something you are, you know about? Um, I don't, but I know that um, H2S made a big difference um, when that was implemented um, in early '44 because the crews were mining prior to that from relatively low heights, from usually about 200 to 500 to 1,000 feet or so. Um, but with the development of, of better direction finding techniques, that meant that they weren't having to take a bearing from landmarks on the coast and they could then therefore fly at a much higher height and they could drop their mines with more precision um, so that it was a lot less dangerous for them from that time onward. So that, that made a big difference. Yeah. OK, so my last question is going and then we'll round, round things up or wrap things up is that. People like yourself, who you know, you've been to the archives, you've studied this stuff, you've you've, you've got a, a taste for it. 
and I'm sure there will be some kind of mind laying book in someone's future as a result of this. And certainly you're, you've done your masters and your thesis on this, but you know, are, my question to you is kind of a bit, bit depressing really, but are we likely to, to buck the trend in the, over the next couple of decades? Are we just going to go and see more and more books about the pinpoint bombing raids and the mosquitoes going in and Lancaster's going, because that really is what the public are interested in. And even if there was lots of lovely shiny covered books in bookstores about the mind laying aspect, they're going to come out second to 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 the the more dramatic side of things. Very probably, but we've got to try and educate people and yeah. just to realise that you know World War Two isn't all Lancasters, Dambusters, and D Day. You know, and it's just so much more than that. It's all about expanding people's horizons, broadening the horizons, and giving them a better understanding of all of the different elements which combine to achieve the Allied victory. Because ultimately, that, that's, that's what, what we're talking about. Mm. You know, it drives me insane when I see documentaries on TV, you know, the bomber that won the war. God, that really gets my gut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Too no, simplistic. Things like yeah, that. It drives me insane. And because there's so much, mm. such a narrow focus in the media and in popular history, we just get the same stuff rehashed and regurgitated all the time. And I'm in the business of trying to get people to think differently about things and to see things from a a, a different angle yes it's, well definitely it's, i mean and it's I mean, a, the know, it's a hard ask but you know yeah um, we've only we've appro a addressed something like 10 percent of the questions that came in today and so which proves that this this loyal audience that we have here is interested in knowing more about this there it is it's not just starting with it's starting with your presentation but people are now i mean for example christopher is asking did RAF mine laying efforts influence US Army Air Force from mine laying efforts around Japan in 1945, for example? So that's probably another area of study that someone could pick up on and take this. And Trent Telenko, who studies the Pacific, there's this is a, this is a portal to lots more study. Whereas some of those oft dis, oft discussed subjects, mm -hmm. there's not much else to say except the opinions of who's great and who isn't great. Your know, market garden, that kind of thing. This has new areas yeah. to approach. Well, it's funny you mentioned the um, US mining around Japan because that has been studied um, to quite some degree. And one of the reasons for that is that the US Strategic Bombing Survey covers this. It, it does look at it. Um, and my, mine laying was a, considered at, at the time and afterwards as a very, very important part of the American strategy against Japan, sort of basically choking the country and cutting off all the supplies and it was recognized and it's been recognized subsequently and there has been work done on that but what i'm arguing is that well we should be doing the same with bomber command mine lane well you've done a good job today starting off on our in our small little world here and the fact that we've got lots of questions is great and i'm hoping people will um you know make more comments and questions for you on twitter or contact you yeah by, by all means just carry get on the conversation just, and yeah just and it's, it'll be a two-way street i'm sure there's people watching who've got some information they can give to you as well as you oh, give absolutely. Information God, to them. Yeah. so it's i'm still so learning about this topic it's so vast yeah well, it's been a wonderful talking to you, Jane, and I will end it now because I've got a big coughing fit coming up. I can feel Good it coming, deal. so I'm going to I'm gonna, I quit while I'm ahead. It's been great talking to you. I can't wait to have you come on and talk about a future project that we talked about before you went yeah. online. That'll be really exciting. But um, as for now, thank you very much for appearing on the channel. And folks, I'll get all the shows listed for next week over the weekend, but I will see you all then. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, viewers. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye.